everyone. Um, we'll begin, I'm sure, as I can see, more of you are joining, so you'll only miss my introduction. But thank you so much for joining. It's wonderful to see so many of you doing so and choosing to spend your August evening with us. Um, or, of course, if you're James or other people, it might be morning or afternoon, um, depending on where you're signing in from, of course, across the world. But wherever you are, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the How To Academy. Uh, what promises to be a fascinating, eye-opening event and one that has the potential to be quite profoundly life-changing um, or life-enhancing, I should say, because the changes are positive all the way and can be achieved in the most simple of ways. And that life-altering impact is certainly something uh, and effect the book that has inspired our event has had on many of its readers. And it has had many readers. For following its publication last year, here it is, Breath, the New Science of Lost Art, of a Lost Art, and I'm sure many of you have got a copy. Um, it spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list uh, and has continued top bestseller lists all over the world and been hailed as the book that will ensure you never breathe the same way again. And breathing, of course, we all know, taking air in, letting it out, something we all do, mostly without giving it much thought, on repeat, 25,000 times a day. It's essential to our health, we know this too, and yet apparently 90% of us are getting it entirely wrong. That's the bad news. The good news is that we can actually get it right, and we like good news at the How To Academy. And thanks uh, to our guest this evening, really, that is, he spent at least a decade, he'll probably tell me it's a lot more, on a dedicated mission to show us how we can get it right. He's an author and a journalist. He's written for the BBC, the New York Times, the Atlantic, um, many more. And he's, of course, the author of this book. So, James Nestor, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, I've got so many questions and I have absolutely no doubt that those people who have signed in have got very many questions too. So I should say that I have about 45 minutes to ask mine. Not enough, but I'll try my best. And then, of course, it'll be over to you um, listening. So please do write your questions in and I'll try and get through as many as possible. And I'm sure many of them will be answered in the book if you haven't read it too. But as I alluded to, central to the premise of the book is that we are, all of us, 90% of us, most of us, getting breathing wrong. And we need to relearn how to do it. And I know the reaction that you very often get is people say, well, I've actually been breathing my whole life. It could be a long life of breathing and I'm absolutely fine, thank you very much. Why do I suddenly need a book to tell me how to relearn something I do every day? Well, that's exactly what I believed when I first started researching breathing is I didn't think it was something that we could really hone that would be able to transform us in so many ways. And I especially didn't think that there was a respiratory pandemic. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about deficiencies in breathing across wide populations. But when you start actually looking at the data and when you start looking into yourself, you realize that most people are breathing inadequately or improperly. Well, what does that mean to breathe inadequately or improperly? Uh, snoring, sleep apnea, chronically stuffy nose, asthma, COPD, other respiratory issues, all of these are breathing disorders. And some of us don't have them every single day of the year, but they occur throughout different seasons, right? Just like allergies do. So when you start looking at that, and if you start looking at the incidences of respiratory infections as well, and you look at other animals in the animal kingdom, you realize that no other animals are suffering from these things on the scale that humans are. And it turned out that our ancestors, our human ancestors, weren't suffering on the scale that we suffer from these things either. And so the more I dug into this, the more I realized that there was this hidden epidemic that we have essentially lost the ability to breathe properly. And I wanna just clear up one thing. The fact that I'm alive right now and I'm living that means I'm able to breathe, sure, but compensation is different than health, right? So there are people who have been eating their whole lives as well, right? They've been eating junk foods and their, their bodies are breaking down. So we can get by eating bad food, but that doesn't mean it's healthy for us. And breathing is where we get most of our energy. Most of our energy is from breath, from oxygen. So how we take that breath in, how we exhale it makes an enormous difference to our health and well-being. 
just before we find out from you after all your research how we should be doing it right this i mean let's just talk a little bit about that research this was a very personal mission for you and you went on you know a seriously long intensive a huge journey so what prompted it um you know perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the length of, of your research because it's quite clear this has become still is after such a long time a labor of love for you now well, it was a, a personal issue I was interested in, which was the problem for me as a journalist, as a science journalist. I don't write memoirs. I don't want to write things from just from my perspective. I want to write about data. I want to write about research, right? But I, I kept having these specific instances in which uh, my breathing was really suffering. And I thought this was perfectly normal to suffer from bronchitis quite often, to suffer from mild pneumonia once a year, to suffer from wheezing when I was running normal because everyone else I knew had these same problems. But then I started really looking into it and wondering what is the core issue of these problems? People say, oh, it's because you're growing older. Oh, it's because you surf a lot. I wasn't really going for that. So I started looking into breathing, the role of breathing, and if healthy breathing could actually help reduce the symptoms of these problems. And it turns out that there was some science supporting that idea. So I started exploring this myself, having my own experiences, feeling how this was changing me. But it was really a conundrum for me because again, I had no intention of, of writing a personal story of my transformation for breathing. Other people can do that. That's not my thing as a journalist. So I just kept with this uh, story, my, my own personal development for years and years because I didn't know what to do with this, with this work, what was happening. And it was eventually when I met free divers, these are people who do something that is supposed to be scientifically impossible, okay, medically impossible. They can hold their breath for seven, eight, nine minutes at a time. The longest breath hold is 12 and a half minutes. And they can dive down to depths of around 150 meters on a single breath of air. And so I was on a reporting mission to write about free divers. I saw this, I thought, my God, these people are able to do this with their breath control underwater. Where else can breathing bring us uh, on land? You know, what else can it do for us? If these people are doing something that is supposed to be impossible, what other impossible things can we measure? Can we find out about breathing? And that's really what set me on this path. It was a circuitous path. Uh, many forks in the road. Uh, this book took me forever. Um, I had to keep rewriting it because the stuff, the research seemed so fantastical. It seemed so improbable. But then there's the research, you know, there's the x-rays, there's the data. And, and eventually uh, I, I realized that there was a deeper story in the seemingly simple mundane subject of breathing. But it's extraordinary, isn't it? Your, your book has done of course so well because it's you know a, a miraculous potentially miraculous cure and yet we've waited for your book to find that out there's so little the virtues of, of this of, of breath and of breathing and this simple technique is so little told in western medicine you, you say in the book how could this be so important and so unimportant at the same time and i just wonder why why have we had to wait and I'm not putting down journalism, of course, as my, my, my career, but why have we had to wait for a journalist to sort of tell us about this and to wait for your book? Well, I would love to take that credit, but I can't because there's been so many people in the field that have been doing this research for literally decades, top institutions at Harvard, at Stanford, at Oxford, more at Yale. So they've been saying this over and over, but their work has been hidden in academic journals. And let's be honest, these scientific studies are very hard to read. <laughs> They're written in a language that is not accessible to the general population. So my job is to find these people, interview them, look at their research, look at the studies they've done, and try to translate their English into the English that other people can understand. So I'm just a filter for this. Uh, my own personal story made it in a little bit to that into the book. I didn't want it to be in there. Uh, my editor insisted just to give a little context of my background. But the, the real subject is the reader. And I wanted to make that very important that each page is a mirror onto the reader and allowing them to understand their body more. If I have to show up and pop my head in 
to be a straw man here and there, I'm fine with doing that. But at the end of the book, I want people to understand their breathing and how it can affect them more. So to answer your question about, you know, why did it take so long? I, I think the best parallel to this would be nutrition, right? We've known for over a hundred years, I can show you scientific studies of researchers saying that the modern industrial diet is going to destroy our health. Okay. We've known this. How long did it take us to move away from canned fruits and vegetables to eating everything processed to wonder bread, processed grains? Uh, we're still eating a lot of this stuff. We know it's bad for us, but it seems like maybe in the past 20 years or so, many of us have gotten the clue that, that what we have been told about diet has been completely wrong, right? Um, most of the stuff I ate growing up is just, just appalling. Um, and, and to think that we have been told that this is a part of, of a healthy diet to eat all of these processed high sugar grains is, is just garbage. So I think that breathing is following in that, that same sort of arc in which the ancients have known about this for literally thousands of years. Scientists have been testing this for hundreds of years and Western science have been, have been showing this. But uh, I think just recently with the COVID epidemic, we've lost the ability to breathe. And so people say, hey, maybe breathing is important. And I think that that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons that so many people are more aware of their breath and what it can do for us and what happens when we breathe dysfunctionally, how it can ruin our health so quickly. Let's make sure we, let's talk about, about all of those things, you know, what it can do for us, what happens when we don't do it right. And there are so many different areas and techniques that you say um, by your hundredth breath and the breath and the close of this book, um, you and I will know how the air that enters your lungs affects every moment of your life and how to harness its full potential until your final breath. There's a lot to take in, as I say, through the pages. And before we go into some of the bits in more detail, I, I wonder if you, you would be able to sort of articulate what your main hope that readers would take away. If they, if they were to sort of take away one thing to tell people and to take into their lives from this, from this book and also from this talk, what would be that kind of main point? I think the main point is not to take your breath for granted, right? Just because you are, are breathing doesn't mean you're necessarily breathing well. So there are permutations in that. And Western science has focused so much on that you're breathing. So my father-in-law is a pulmonologist. My brother-in-law is an ER doctor, right? We talk about this stuff all the time uh, about the problems associated with not breathing. But so few of us in, in Western medicine are talking about how exactly you're breathing and how you can switch your breathing to really transform your bodies in a lot of in a lot of ways. So I think that the takeaway would be that this is something, our breath is something that is so powerful. I show you how powerful it is in the book, but in order to really appreciate it, you need to find out yourself. And luckily, this isn't asking you to go on a diet for six months or to start exercising two hours a day. Our breathing is something we carry around with us our entire life. So we can focus on our breath, no matter if we're watching a Zoom conference, or if we're jogging, or if we're answering emails, and we can reap the benefits from that. The science is, is so clear on that. So it feels to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the main and most crucial aspect of breathing that we're getting wrong is keeping our mouths open. And your rule is, in capital letters, I feel I've written in capital letters, shut your mouth. So please explain this for people who aren't, aren't familiar with it. Should we be breathing all the time, in and out, through our noses? And what happens when we don't do that, when we breathe through our mouth instead? So on the, the foundation of healthy breathing, the first part is awareness, right? You have to become aware of your breath. And now we can get into some of the nitty gritty of, of what you can do after you become aware of your breathing. So you're 100% right is... The first thing you need to do is shut your mouth and breathe through your nose. Um, and I'm more convinced now than I've ever been that no matter what you eat, no matter how much you're exercising or whatever, if you are a mouth breather, you're never, ever going to be healthy. And this is because our nose, it, the job of the nose is to filter air. It's to condition it. It's to heat it. It's to moisten it. There's 30 other functions of the nose, right? Because we want that air that we take into our bodies to be pressurized, 
to be conditioned so that we can extract more oxygen from it. That's what the nose does. This is an incredibly ornate, sophisticated, complex organ. And if you looked at a cross section of it, it has all of these different pathways, it's covered in different tissues, there's hair in there, there's, there's mucus in there. All of these things serve a purpose. We're meant to breathe through our noses. That doesn't mean you can't occasionally breathe through your mouth as a backup system. Of course you can. I'm breathing through my mouth a little bit as I'm talking to you now. When you're laughing, you breathe through your mouth, right? This is all perfectly fine, but the primary route through which you should be bringing air in and out of your body is the nose. And if you don't believe me, look at any other animal in the wild and look at how it's breathing. Look at a cheetah when it's running at 50 miles per hour. You know, it's still breathing through its nose. All other animals are habitual nasal breathers. Modern humans are not. And we can see from the skeletal record that our ancestors were also habitual nasal breathers. How do we know that? Because we can look at the way that their skulls have been formed over the ages, okay? And if you're a mouth breather, your face is gonna grow differently. We know that as well. So I could give you a whole laundry list of reasons, but um, listen to what your mom said, you know, stand up straight, shut your mouth, and uh, you'll be much better off. <laughs> and I'm sure people just from that, and there's just so many more questions that follow. I mean, what you go into in depth in the book is that the time, so we could think about that during the day. Let's come on to exercise later where it goes out the window. I've been trying and that would be from experience. But um, at night, and this is where, you know, you talk about uh, many people breathe through their mouths at night. And you suggest doing something that feels quite extreme, which is taping up your mouth at night to stop yourself doing that. Yeah. And I, again, I wish I could take credit for this hack. Uh, I can't because it sounded so suspicious and sketchy when I first heard about it. So more than 60% of the population breathes through an open mouth at night. If you're waking up throughout the night and your mouth is dry, if you constantly need to drink water, if you go to sleep with a huge mug of water by your bed, this is what I did for as long as I've known, you are a mouth breather at night. And that's not good because a third of your life, you're taking in unprocessed, unfiltered air. So all the dust, allergens, mold, pollution, whatever else there is in the environment, is gonna enter straight into your lungs. So when you're breathing through your mouth, you can think of your lungs as an external organ, right? There's no filter to it at all. So easier said than done, shut your mouth. In the daytime, that's a little easier because you can become aware of it because you're conscious. What happens when we go to sleep and when gravity works against us? Most of us do this. And we breathe through an open mouth. So I had learned from Dr. Ann Kearney at Stanford. I had talked with her early on and she said, oh, I prescribe tape to all of my patients. I said, what are you, what are you talking about? She said, yeah they put a little piece of tape on their lips to keep their mouths shut, which to me, I thought this was some like hostage situation, but it's, it's really not. It's this very uh, light adhesive tape placed in the middle of your mouth. And it turns out that so many leaders in the field of both sleep medicine, dentistry, and more prescribe tape to, to adolescents, to kids, to adults to keep their mouth shut. This is not a pleasant thing at the beginning, everybody. So just, just to be clear, my experience, I think, was similar to other people where it was so awkward and it felt so weird. But after a while, I got used to it after a couple of weeks. Now it's really hard for me to get a good night's sleep without it. And I know this because I track my sleep and I can see a huge ding to my sleep quality when I don't wear this tape. So I've, I've been wearing it for, for years. I was listening to a podcast with you earlier where the interviewer, Rangan Chatterjee, I'm sure many people know him, um, said that his wife had started and now bounces out of bed about three hours earlier than she did and just feels amazing. So you've, you've and I know you've had a great deal of, of feedback across the board that just ha has had revolutionary effects on people. <laughs> Yeah, and, and those are just two anecdotes, right? Those are just two case studies. You shouldn't take that as, as scientific proof or anything. Luckily, there's been so much science 
showing the difference of sleeping with a closed mouth, it's becoming an obligate nasal breather at night. It can reduce snoring. It can reduce some forms of sleep apnea. It can vastly improve your sleep. Uh, no one's really arguing with this, right? Uh, it, this isn't very controversial stuff. And yet you have the majority of the population that had never been told this before, right? <laughs> People with snoring and sleep apnea uh, have never been, been, it's never been mentioned to them that this can help reduce your incidences of sleep apnea and snoring. I wanna be very clear, this is not a cure-all for everything and it's not gonna fix every one of every problem, but this is a hack that is free, that is available to everyone and there are no negative side effects to breathing through your nose at night. You're only gonna benefit from that. It's gonna be awkward at the beginning if you've been a habitual mouth breather for, for decades and decades, but there's no negative side effects. And see for yourself, track your own sleep, and I, I think you'll see what happens. Uh, you know, When we're sleeping, this is the time for our bodies to restore themselves. They shouldn't be stressed. What happens when you're snoring and have sleep apnea? <laughs> You're stressing yourself out for eight hours. Uh, you get a, a jump in blood sugar. And this is why sleep apnea has been tied to the onset of diabetes in adulthood and Alzheimer's and on and on because sleep is our time to restore. When you breathe through your nose, you're going to calm your body down. You're going to get more oxygen. You're going to open up the airways more. So uh, once you... Uh, learn it that way um, and, and look at it that way that there are only benefits to be had. I think it's a little easier to do this crazy thing, which is to put a little piece of tape on your mouth and see if that works for you.